As disciples of the Buddha, we mustn't live our lives only to rot and decompose without having found anything genuine within ourselves. When death comes, die letting go of the body and the mind, laying them down without attachment. Pureness of Heart For the next ten years, Manchi Gao energetically committed herself to the spiritual well-being of the community she had founded. Then, suddenly, in June of 1977, she fell seriously ill. The symptoms had been accumulating in her body for some time, but, not wanting to inconvenience others, she had kept quiet about them. When her condition became too obvious to hide, she was admitted to a hospital. The doctors discovered that she had tuberculosis in one of her lungs. Further tests revealed that she had diabetes as well. By then her body was weak and pale, and racked by severe pain. Her symptoms had already reached a critical stage. Fearful of the worst, the medical staff suspected that her case was terminal. The most favorable prognosis was that she might live another year or two with constant medical attention. Then, when Mei Chi Gao started wheezing and coughing blood, more tests were administered. The doctors discovered a malignant tumor lodged within her other lung. With three diseases now confirmed, tuberculosis, diabetes, and cancer, her prospects for survival dimmed. A month after being admitted, Manchi Gao insisted on leaving the hospital and returning to her nunnery, even though her condition remained very critical. If she was going to die, she preferred to die in the peace and tranquility of the forest she loved, surrounded by the care and affection of her spiritual companions. Although her body was weighed down by sickness, her heart was free of all burdens. Machi Gao was not concerned for her own well-being, and she had no fear of dying. The welfare of her companions, her supporters, and her friends was far more important to her. Her nature shone with a clear brightness that illuminated their paths and lightened their hearts. Difficulties seemed to dissolve in the presence of her pure love. There was only one place she wanted to live out her final days the place where she could be of the greatest benefit to the most people. A medical doctor from Bangkok, a lady devotee named Dr. Pensri Makranon, volunteered to join Manchi Gao at Ban Hui Sai to oversee her medical treatment. Dr. Pensri, who had been a practicing physician for twenty years, started by treating the tuberculosis and the diabetes with the most up-to-date remedies known to her profession. She administered a strict regimen of antibiotics to counter the tuberculosis, and gave regular insulin injections to curb the diabetes. But for the cancer, she had no remedy, so she administered none. Dr. Pensri would later recall that treating Manchi Gao was the hardest assignment of her medical career. She felt she lacked the spiritual training needed to treat an arahant to the best of her ability, while at the same time not being disrespectful to the wishes of her enlightened patient. Aware that people who recover from one disease are bound to die from another, Dr. Pensri focused on treating the sick person, rather than the disease. Since Manchi Gao was certain to die one day anyway, the doctor simply tried her best to ensure Manchi Gao remained as comfortable as possible. For this reason, every time that Dr. Pensri wanted to give Manchi Gao a particular medicine, the doctor would describe her diagnosis and explain the recommended treatment. It was then up to Manchi Gao whether to accept or not. If she refused, Dr. Pensri would not pressure her in any way. Though it dragged on for another fourteen years, ill health did not prevent Machi Gao from fulfilling her religious obligations and practicing meditation. She simply continued to live life as best she could, compensating for infirmity by adapting her daily routine to fit the increasing limitations imposed by physical decline. Her presence exuded an exceptional gentleness and humility. She never tired of extolling the virtues of those who gave her assistance. In appreciation of the doctor's generosity, she always held the medicines she received above her head with both hands before taking them. She met each person who came to her nunnery in the same way, without bias, and responded to their queries with inspirational words of wisdom. Her mind remained clear, and she kept teaching. Knowing that the human body is caught in a relentless march toward death, she accepted her condition without regrets and selflessly shared her remaining time and energy with those who came to seek her grace. Throughout her prolonged infirmity, 
Mechi Gao found eating and digesting food increasingly more difficult. As a consequence, she ate only sparingly, one tiny mouthful at a time. Most of her teeth were lost to the ravages of old age, so she chewed very slowly and deliberately, often taking an hour to finish a meager portion of food. Sometimes, due to weakness or disinterest, she nodded off while chewing. She knew the human form to be devoid of lasting essence, but bearing it was nonetheless truly a heavy burden, and the older and frailer she grew, the more of a drag that weight became. Manchi Gao's physical frame crumbled bit by bit. Her faculties slowly wasted away. Knowing the truth of human embodiment, she expected no less. She became afflicted with glaucoma in one eye, which caused her blood pressure to rise dangerously, but she staunchly refused to seek medical treatment. Nature was simply taking its course, so let it be. Many months later, when an examination was finally arranged, the doctors discovered that the glaucoma had caused her to go blind in one eye. The other eye was overlaid by a cloudy film of cataract, though its effect was not so severe as to prevent her from seeing. She also suffered from a debilitating backache, which caused her to walk in a stoop that greatly impaired her movements. Her legs became weak, and soon she was unable to move around without help. Eventually she woke up one morning to find that she could no longer walk. She must now be carried everywhere, even for bathing and relieving herself. Machi Gao had dedicated her life to Buddhism in a spirit of love and friendship. Even as death approached, she set an example of working tirelessly to help others, leaving a lasting impression on her close disciples and on the doctor who nursed her so devotedly. Even though her body was tormented with pain, she remained unperturbed and never complained. Free from suffering, knowing the many realms of sentient existence, knowing her past births and her present enlightenment, knowing how to perform miracles and read the minds of others, Nachi Gao was serenely unmoved by the strains of physical hardship. Chin sagging, face sunken, skin ashen and deeply wrinkled, Nachi Gao's body lay on its deathbed proclaiming loudly the unmistakable signs of age and sickness. Its life-sustaining faculties were slowly succumbing to the strain, wearing down and ebbing away, as though the life force was preparing to vacate. Body and mind waited for past Gamma to release its grip and allow their breakup to commence. But, empty of both mind and body, the indestructible pure essence pervaded everything and awaited nothing. When Ajahn Mahabua came to visit his ailing disciple that day, he advised her medical attendants to allow nature to take its course. Machi Gao had lived her life for the sake of others. It was time now for them to let her die in peace. They should not disturb an Arahant's final passing away. By that time her lungs had become so dense and clogged with fluid that she could scarcely take a breath. Her emaciated body lay stiff and motionless her mouth sagging open, her eyes half-closing. Listening for signs of life, her attendants could no longer hear the sounds of breathing. It was obvious that the end was nearing, and none of them dared to take their eyes off her. As her breathing grew fainter and finer, tapering off ever so gently, it finally appeared to cease altogether. It ended so delicately, so serenely, that no one was sure at which precise moment she had finally passed away. Her physical presence remained so still and tranquil that it revealed nothing out of the ordinary. Mechi Gao passed away in perfect peace on the morning of June 18, 1991. Her individual essence, flowing freely like a stream merging with rivers and seas, had at last dissolved completely into a vast, still ocean of timeless emptiness. Soon afterward, Ajahn Mahabua came to view her body. He stood silently for a long while, contemplating the withered corpse wrapped neatly in a fine white cloth, then solemnly performed a ritual bathing. He set June 23 as the date for her cremation, which allowed sufficient time for her relatives and faithful followers in distant locations to pay their final respects and participate in the ceremony. Ajahn Mahabur refused to permit any funeral chanting during the ceremony, 
reasoning that since Machi Gao was already fully accomplished within herself, nothing further needed to be added. On the evening of June 22, Ajahn Mahabua delivered a tamma oration to inspire the large crowd of monks and supporters who had gathered to honor Machi Gao, the foremost female arahant of the modern era. In death, Machi Gao directs our attention to the true nature of this world, for all of us, without exception, will die one day. Being born as human beings, we should make good use of this auspicious birth, as it is our best opportunity to strive for spiritual perfection within our hearts. There is no reason to doubt the Lord Buddha's teaching. The Four Noble Truths stand as testimony to its veracity. If we faithfully follow the Buddha's teaching in our meditation practice, we will inevitably develop the paths and their fruition to perfection. As long as there are people who practice Buddhism properly, the world will never be devoid of Arahants. Machi Gao was a shining example of this truth, a present-day Arahant of rare virtue. She died just like the rest of us will. However, it was the virtuous qualities she developed deep within her heart that are the real significance, the true essence of her being, and not her death. The heart is fundamental. It dictates all of our actions, both good and bad, so it is incumbent on us to develop our hearts to the fullest while we still have the opportunity to do so. Machi Gao's cremation ceremony took place on the following afternoon, inside the nunnery compound at Ban Hui Sai. More than two hundred monks and thousands of devoted lay followers were in attendance to pay their final homage. In a gesture of devotion and respect, long lines of monks, nuns, and lay devotees filed past her casket, placing bright blossoms made from fragrant sandalwood shavings around the ornate casket until they were heaped high on the funeral pyre. As the crowd sat in reverent silence, Ajahn Mahabua touched a flame to the dry tinder beneath the casket. Flames shot up and palls of thick smoke billowed around the pyre and into the hot afternoon air. Suddenly, and quite unexpectedly, a cooling, gentle rain began to fall on the entire assembly. Late that evening, when the fire had burned itself out and the ashes began to crumble and cool, Monks and nuns gathered silently around the smoldering remains of Machi Gao's funeral pyre. The extreme heat of the pyre had caused the bones in her body to break apart and disintegrate, leaving behind many small, porous fragments bleached to an ashen-white hue by the fire. Gingerly, with a sense of awe and reverence, senior monks picked bone fragments from the gray ash and charcoal, placing the pieces carefully on trays of white cloth. The relics were retrieved with great care and kept solemnly until the following morning, when countless bone fragments from Machi Gao's body were shared among her faithful supporters as sacred keepsakes. They have been cherished ever since as rare gems of unblemished virtue. Being the relics of an arahant, they are infused with a supramundane spiritual potency that blesses those who possess them with good fortune, and even seeming miracles, in direct proportion to the strength of faith and virtue that the owners maintain in their hearts. In the following months and years, many of those pieces of bone underwent a miraculous transformation. Over time, the physical elements gradually coalesced and crystallized, forming dense, hard gemstones, some translucent and angular like crystal, others colorful and polished smooth like beach pebbles. Such bone relics, the physical remnants of an arahant's pure essence, are an ineffable mystery of the mind's pure essence lifeless bone fragments transmuting into diamonds and pearls. They indicate the cleansing effect that the pure mind of the arahant exerts on the body's material elements. The intrinsic level of samadhi that an arahant maintains throughout all daily activities works steadily to cleanse those basic elements until they too become purified. That purifying action results in a transmutation of ordinary bone into crystalline relics after they pass away. The extraordinary beauty and brilliance of Machi Gao's bone relics were often cited as proof, should further proof be needed, that she was indeed an Arya Sawika, a genuine daughter of the Lord Buddha. <laughs>